topic for today is the energy that is associated with bonds. During a chemical reaction, reactant bonds are broken and product bonds are formed. So for instance, in this example of methane undergoing combustion, we've got the bonds in the methane, the carbon-hydrogen bonds being broken, and the oxygen-oxygen uh, oxygen bonds in O2 being broken, and then we have those atoms reconfiguring themselves um, so that now we've got a couple of oxygen-carbon bonds and we have four oxygen-hydrogen bonds. So these bonds get broken and new bonds get formed. The basis of the reaction. This is the reaction. Breaking bonds always requires energy. It is an endothermic process to break bonds. So energy is absorbed in disrupting that force of attraction between two atoms. So energy is required to break bonds and forming bonds always releases energy. So when bonds are formed, energy is released. Now, does that mean that every reaction is exothermic? Absolutely not. Because remember, it's a balance sheet. It's a balance sheet between the amount of energy that goes into breaking the bonds and the amount of energy that is released forming the bonds. So for a quick reminder, if the energy released in forming the bonds is greater than the energy that was required to break the, the, the reactive bonds, then the reaction is exothermic. So remember, it's a scorecard between the two. We're taking the entire system as a whole. So again, if the energy released forming the product bonds is greater than the energy that was required to break the reactant bonds, then the overall reaction enthalpy change is going to be exothermic. Energy is going to be released into the environment. Conversely, if the energy required to break the reactant bonds is greater than the amount of energy that is released forming the product bonds, then we say that the reaction is endothermic. Overall, it has absorbed more energy than it has released. But remember, there's always an absorption and a release. It's just how do the two balance out as to overall is the reaction exothermic or is the reaction endothermic? And so now let's talk about bond energy. So by definition, bond energy, or also known as bond enthalpy, see it both ways, refers to the amount of energy required to break that bond. Okay, so that is the convention that we define, define the bond energy is how much energy must be absorbed to actually break that bond. How much energy is required to break that bond. And it's different for every pair of atoms that are bonding. So every bond has its own unique bond energy. For instance, a carbon-hydrogen bond has a bond energy of 413 kilojoules per every mole of this carbon hydrogen. A sulfur hydrogen bond, on the other hand, 
has a bond energy of 339 kilojoules per mole. I wonder what kinds of things go into dictating how much bond energy um, two bonded atoms have. Hmm, I wonder. Okay, so it's different for any two atoms. And um, you would have to be given this information to do a problem with it. Nobody's expecting you to memorize it. Okay. Because bond breaking is always endothermic, always, energy is absorbed breaking a bond, bond energy is always going to be a positive number. Now let's compare some multiple bonds here. So a single carbon-carbon bond is 348 kilojoules per mole. Um, a carbon-carbon double bond has a bond energy of 614 kilojoules per mole. And a carbon-carbon triple bond has a bond energy of 839 kilojoules per mole. So clearly, the multiple bonds store, require more energy to break than a single bond. All right, so let's talk about the lengths. We can say, um, uh, or the vernacular is, this single bond has a bond order of one, this double bond has a bond order of two, and triple bond has a bond order of three. Let's talk about their lengths a little bit, their bond length. So we did this a little bit when we talked about resonance. Of these one, two, three bonds, which is the shortest bond? Which one has the, the least amount of distance between the two carbon atoms? That's going to be the triple bond. So this is the shortest, meaning that the distance, I did not, clearly I did not do these to scale. The distance between carbon and carbon here um, is the shortest in this triple bond. The carbon-carbon double bond, that is the intermediate length. And the carbon-carbon single bond is going to be the longest. And um, in general, shorter bonds tend to be stronger bonds. And, you know, that shouldn't surprise anybody because the force of attraction is going to be greater when um, the, the distance between the two attractive bodies is closer. Okay, so the last thing we're going to do is we are going to look at a method in which we can calculate delta H using bond energies. So bond energies can be used, or bond enthalpies, can be used to determine the overall change in enthalpy, or the delta H, for a reaction. Now, I purposefully did not do this when we did thermochemistry because you're going to see there's something very different about this formula than what we have done before. Okay, so to calculate delta H utilizing bond energies, we are going to take the sum of the energies of the bonds broken and we're going to subtract that from the sum of the energies of the bonds formed. Now, whenever we did heats of formation, to, to determine delta H, remember we did products, sum of products minus sum of reactants. Okay, do you see this is opposite? This is opposite, so do not be confused here. The energies, the sum of the energies of all the bonds that are broken minus the sum of the energies of all the bonds formed, and that can give us the overall enthalpy change of the reaction. So let's, let's do an example of this combustion of methane. So let's find the delta H utilizing bond energies. So delta H is going to be equal to the sum of the bonds broken. So that's our reactants. So this is what we have to do. 
we've got four carbon-hydrogen bonds here in this methane molecule. Draw a Lewis structure, you'll see it. We've got four carbon-hydrogen bonds. So that means we've got four carbon hydrogen. Four carbon hydrogen bonds. Again, draw the Lewis structure and you'll see it. Plus, in this case, we have two oxygen oxygen double bonds. And again, how did I determine that? Draw the Lewis structure for it. And you'll see that we've got two oxygen to oxygen double bonds. Minus the sum of the bonds formed. How many carbon-oxygen bonds do we have in carbon dioxide? We have two carbon-oxygen bonds. How do I know that? Draw a Lewis structure. So I have two carbon-oxygen double bonds. Okay, so this is important. And Last but not least, I've got water. Each water itself has two oxygen-hydrogen bonds, but we've got two moles of it from our balanced equation. So that means we have four oxygen-hydrogen bonds that are going to be formed. Okay, I'm not taking the time to make these Lewis structures. You can make the Lewis structures yourself and see that my accounting is correct. So you have to see how many bonds you're breaking and what kinds of bonds you're breaking and how many and what kinds of bonds you're forming. And you're going to know that from making the Lewis structures for these things. Okay, so then last but not least we have to go to a table that will give us these values. So this is going to end up being four times, um, let's see, the bond energy for carbon-hydrogen bond is 413 kilojoules per mole plus two times the bond energy for an oxygen-oxygen double bond is 495 kilojoules per mole minus two times a carbon-oxygen double bond is 799 kilojoules per mole plus four times an oxygen-hydrogen bond is 463 kilojoules per mole. All right. You guys go ahead and do this math. I will be looking tomorrow to see your delta H. What is our overall change in enthalpy for this reaction? As well as I want you to tell me, based on your number, is this reaction, and we should know this, so really you're just matching up to make sure you did it correctly, uh, is this reaction endothermic or exothermic?